Good afternoon and welcome to Family and Community Medicine uh, Grand Rounds today. Uh, we have a fantastic presentation lined up for you. Um, the topic for today is Family Medicine and Abortion, Responding to the Evolving Crisis in Access to Reproductive Health Care. Um, just as a reminder, this session is being recorded and will be posted on the, um, the Family and Community Medicine website. Uh, when we're done. And if you want to look back and review previous sessions, those are available there too. Um, if you uh, have suggestions for grand rounds today for any of our presentations or ideas for future grand rounds, I would encourage you to fill out the evaluation, which will be available um, in the, uh, the uh, Q&A and chat sections. Uh, uh, in addition, today's presentation will be very interactive. We're hoping that everybody will ask our presenters lots of great questions. So please go ahead and use the Q&A uh, the Q &A box for your questions and our presenters will respond to them live or um, on a written format. We encourage a lot of dialogue today. Um, the the uh, session name again, for those of you who just joined us is Family Medicine and Abortion, Responding to the Evolving Crisis and Access to Reproductive Health Care. Our presenters today are Dr. Christine Dellendorf, Dr. Mai Fleming, and Dr. Leela Pollock, all of whom are um, uh, faculty members in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at UCSF. Uh, the, the concept for the session today is to uh, for us to dive into discussion. Family medicine's core values include continuity of care, meetings, patients, and communities needs, care across the life course, and social justice. Abortion care is clearly aligned with those values, particularly in the current political and legislative, legislative climate, where access to abortion is increasingly limited and abortion care increasingly stigmatized. Our presenters today will discuss the current state of abortion access in California and in the US as a whole, and will then review the research done with new career family physicians about how they understand the values of our specialty and how this understanding relates to their decision-making about abortion care. Our presenters today will also discuss the initiatives to train and support family physicians to provide abortions. Um, at the end, we will have some discussion time uh, with a panel discussion about how family physicians and the specialty of family medicine can act on our values through abortion care and uh, consider provision and advocacy moving ahead. So I would really strongly encourage you to, again, use the Q&A section, section, ask lots of hard questions. Um, I wanna open this session by, um, uh, by letting Dr. Uh, Dellendorf, Dr. Fleming, and Dr. Pollock uh, share their stories, how each of them as a family doctor decided to become an abortion provider. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. Um, I will start by just sharing that my decision to become a family doctor providing abortion started with becoming a family doctor. And I really did this because I believed in the social justice foundation of our specialty. And to me, providing abortions and that social justice foundation are really inextricably intertwined. I also always knew that I wanted to do reproductive health care and wanted to do that from the perspective of providing whole person care and not necessarily having to be a surgeon, an OBGYN. I believe that you can provide reproductive health care in the context of providing primary care. And when I came to the family medicine residency program here at UCSF, I was thrilled back in 2002 that we were one of the first programs to have opt out abortion training. And so this pathway was really facilitated for me to be able to become a, what I wanted to be, family doctor doing abortions. And I also was able to do a research project in residency about the experience of abortion training in family medicine residency programs. So that led me to the pathway that I'm currently on as a family medicine reproductive health researcher. Dr. Fleming. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I went into medicine to become an abortion provider. I saw full spectrum reproductive health care as a tool for equity and justice. Um, and I ended up finding that family medicine was the perfect specialty to incorporate the tenets of social and reproductive justice and activism within medicine, and particularly chose um, my training program here at UCSF in the Family and Community Medicine Department for its really strong history and abortion training and really strong social justice um, approach. And I have a not dissimilar story um, of always being very interested in sexual and reproductive health and uh, and advocacy. Um, and when I was in junior high and high school, participated in sex education theater, which I'd be happy to tell anyone about later. Um, and so uh, knew that I really wanted to also be an abortion provider, but also was very interested in HIV care. 
um, and gender affirming healthcare and family medicine was really the home where I could do all of those things and do it with, as both um, Christine and Mai talked about, do it from the values of really providing patient-centered and patient-driven healthcare um, where patients' needs and priority were, were prioritized. And so um, also didn't even really look at training programs that didn't offer integrated opt-out abortion training um, and now have a career that I am incredibly happy with where I spend a lot of time providing HIV care to um, women living with HIV and focusing on, on reproductive health care for women living with HIV and then also get to the privilege of training uh, family medicine residents to provide abortion care. Great, thank you. Well, I'm going to get us started, share my slides. Um, so we are really excited to be here to talk to you about um, the landscape of family medicine and abortion and abortion access. So I'm gonna first start by saying something that we all know to be true, which is that there are numerous and increasing barriers to abortion access. Dr. Fleming is going to tell us more about this in a second and help us to understand how this relates to our patient's experience of care. But first, I wanna spend a moment reflecting on why this is something those of us in family medicine or those of us in the family medicine field should care about this and should consider this our fight. So in short, family physicians are part of the solution to these barriers to abortion access. Why do I say that? Well, first of all, reproductive health care is what we do. We provide a full range of reproductive health care services from contraceptive counseling to preconception and prenatal care, and also more procedural care like endometrial biopsies and IUD insertions. And we do it in a patient-centered way that takes care of people in the context of their lives. In addition, studies who have looked at this have found that many patients want to get their abortion care from us, that this is something that they want. Some patients want to go to dedicated clinics for reasons including stigma and confidentiality. And so those important high volume clinics are really critical to abortion access. But many patients, especially patients who have primary care doctors want to come to their family physicians to get this care. And then in addition, family physicians, as we all know, often provide care in geographies or in communities that don't have access to other services. And so we can provide this care to people who otherwise would not have access. So to make sure that we all know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about abortion in the context of family medicine, what I'm primarily talking about is first trimester abortion, which is the most common abortion that happens in the United States. While there are certainly family doctors around the country who provide second trimester procedures, predominantly family physicians, particularly in the primary care clinics, are providing first trimester abortions. And this includes medication abortions with mifepristone and mesoprostol, or aspiration abortions using most of the time handheld vacuum aspirators like that shown on this screen. And this is something that is very, these are both very safe options and these can easily be provided in the primary care context. Okay, so I've already shared three reasons why family physicians can provide abortion and why we should care about barriers to abortion access. But I wanna add a fourth one as well, which is that abortion provision is consistent with the values of family medicine. Dr. Fleming, Dr. Pollock and I already shared why we think this is true, but of course we're all abortion providers. So it is important to think about in general in the field of family medicine, is this actually resonate? Does the fact that abortion is consistent with the values of family medicine, is that something that has um, general support? So our team at the Person-Centered Reproductive Health Program was interested in looking at this and understanding how young family physicians, new career family physicians, understand the values of our specialty and how their understanding of the values of this specialty relates to their thinking and decision-making about abortion care. So we went and did a qualitative study where we interviewed from around the country, a uh, new career family physician. And while we chose people that were um, specifically not morally opposed to abortion, for the most part, these were physicians who were not providing abortion services, and most of them didn't even have training. But importantly, despite this, despite the fact that they were not focused on reproductive health care or abortion more specifically, these physicians that we interviewed really reported that they resonated strongly with the idea that family medicine had specific core values. And I show these on, these screen, on the screen, relationships, 
care across the life course, compassionate care, whole person care, meeting community needs and social justice. And then when they were asked to reflect on how this related to abortion provision, they uniformly reflected on the fact that abortion provision was well aligned with these values and a natural part of family medicine. So to give you some more specifics of what this looks like, this was a provider who was thinking about their relationship with patients. What they said was, I think it can be a scary situation for patients. For a lot of patients I serve, sometimes abortion is not necessarily something that their family or the people around them might approve of. And so being able to come to a clinic where they know they can trust a person there, I think is really important. So clearly this provider connected abortion care with their goal of being a trusted resource for their patients. Family doctors in our studies also really expressed that providing abortion care was consistent with their goal of providing care across the life course. One provider said there's no more common experience that a woman has than either being pregnant or trying not to be pregnant. I truly think prenatal care and preconception care are part of family medicine, an important part of family medicine. So kind of access across, so kind of across the board, abortion belongs there. In addition to the life course perspective, another provider shared how abortion is related to another goal of family medicine, which is the idea of taking care of whatever stage of a life course somebody is in, taking care of the whole person, providing the full range of services. And this provider said, part of the reason why I chose family medicine is because I wanted to treat the whole patient. So I think that saying like, I will treat the whole patient except for this little area that I don't feel comfortable treating and I'll send that off to someone else seems like kind of a cop out. So I just think that it's just another service that you can provide that just treats the whole person. Another provider expressed a similar thought about how abortion fit into their goal of providing the full range of services, stating, I would no more deny a patient the option of a medication abortion than I would deny a diabetic person insulin. I just view it, I would say abortion is health care. And we owe it to our patients to provide them excellent care that is consistent with available medical evidence. So in addition to these values related to the interpersonal relationships with, with patients, providers also connected abortion provision with the broader community and societal roles of our specialty. One provider stated, family doctors are sort of geographically everywhere. And so, you know, I think it's particularly important. We're in areas where our patients have difficulty accessing services. It's important that us family doctors, you know, build those skills and meet the needs of the communities that we serve. The providers we interviewed also very clearly connected with this foundation of social justice that the three of us referenced in our introductions. Um, with one provider saying, if you have enough money, you're always gonna be able to travel to a place where you can get an abortion and get your procedure. That was true even before Roe v. Wade. But if you don't have those resources, then your options are much more limited and essentially you don't have the access to the full range of options for your life. And I think that that abortion care really fits into the social justice piece of family medicine. So with that foundation of how abortion is aligned with the goals and the values of our specialty and how these values resonate strongly with a sample across the country, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Fleming to share about the landscape of abortion access that our patients are currently facing. Thank you so much, Dr. Gellendorf. And if you can um, move on to the next slide. And then the next one. Um, so the first thing that I wanna say is that um, while this segment might feel like, um, wow, there are a lot of barriers here. I think um, the take home point is that as family doctors, we actually have, um, we are in a really good place and situation to be primary advocates um, to fight against a lot of these barriers and really make this process much more accessible for our patients. So um, I encourage you to sort of use that lens um, as we navigate through um, the various uh, barriers that exist, uh, you know, moving forward. So the first thing that I'll say is that abortions are extremely common um, over um, over 850,000 abortions happen per year in clinical settings. This doesn't include those performed in hospitals, those outside of clinical settings like self-managed abortions. Um, and one in four people of reproductive potential will have an abortion in their lifetime. 
That being said, there are increasing abortion restrictions and geographical disparities that I think nobody is surprised about, especially which, with what's been going on in this country in the last few years. The number of abortion clinics in the West and the geographic Northeast have grown by 16%. Um, in some places, while the number in the Midwest and South have decreased by almost 10%. Here in California, um, we are lucky in that we are seen as and have actually designated ourselves as a reproductive freedom state. So what that means is that we are a state that protects the right to abortion. It is codified in our state constitution and we have a slew of additional protections, including insurance coverage of abortion care here. But it is really important to note that despite the legal protections, um, the insurance coverage, the reduced comparative stigma for abortion care in California, abortion access does not equal abortion justice. And this is of course true nationally, but also true here in California. Um, and we will discuss where those disparities exist here as well. Next slide, please. So for nearly 50 years, the US has had the right to abortion federally protected and enshrined in the constitution through landmark Supreme Court case Roe v. Wade. Since then, many states have been incrementally attempting to peel back this right through legislation, ranging from restrictions to outright bans. In 2021 alone, 19 state legislatures enacted a combined 108 abortion restrictions, many of which are in direct conflict with Roe v. Wade. At the end of last year, the Supreme Court, um, which now holds a conservative and anti-abortion majority, allowed a blatantly unconstitutional law in Texas to go into effect, um, also known as SB8, while awaiting lower court proceedings. And they have just heard oral arguments for another abortion ban in Mississippi um, called uh, Dobbs v. Jackson, that in addition to banning abortions past 15 weeks gestational age, has also explicitly asked for Roe to be overturned. And the tone of the court's questions during oral arguments of that court case was downright worrisome. So while we won't hear any decisions on that case until June at the earliest, it's really crucial that we start to anticipate what may happen if Roe is overturned and the consequences for ourselves as it's looking more and more likely in the upcoming months. Um, in general, um, if we sort of take a look at this map, the states that are highlighted in red are states with either extensive abortion bans and or trigger bans, which are unenforced bans that will immediately go into effect as soon as federal protections are lost. So while some of these bans were enacted pre-Roe and have just not been enforced these last 50 years, many were actually passed in the last two years in response to the changes of the Supreme Court and in anticipation of and in, with the goal of trying to work towards overturning Roe. The lighter red states on the map have no explicit legal protection for abortion, so access may be at risk if federal protections are lost. The yellow states have some degree of state protections for abortion, and the blue states, including California, have additional expanded access beyond what is guaranteed by the current federal protections. According to the Guttmacher Institute, a great um, research institution on abortion, if Roe falls and the total ban ensues in states with trigger laws in place, California is likely to see a nearly 3,000% or up to 1.4 million person increase in the number of people of reproductive potential whose nearest abortion clinic will be in California. So the most of the people who would be traveling here for care would be from Arizona, which is likely to ban abortions if an abortion ban, um, if federal protections are lost. If uh, the outcome of the Dobbs v. Jackson case is that the 15 week gestational limit is upheld nationally, we're likely to see a 13% increase or up to 250,000 um, person increase um, of people in, in which California would be the closest place that they could receive an abortion. In addition to consideration of the neighboring states, because California also has just generally outstanding reproductive and overall healthcare reputation nationally, um, paired with our abortion protections, it's likely that we start to see many more folks traveling from across the country to seek abortion care services here with ongoing increases in state-based abortion restrictions across the country. And indeed, even with the passage of SB8, many of our colleagues in Southern California are already seeing an uptick of, of, of patients in Texas traveling for care here. Next slide, please. So with the current and anticipated influx of patients from restricted states and many SB8 copycat laws making their way through state legislatures, there are concerns about civil and criminal liability in providing care or assisting a patient from a restricted state in obtaining an abortion, particularly with language such as 
aiding and abetting an abortion written into these laws. Given the unprecedented nature of some of these laws, there are no inherent legal protections currently in place for providers. We have also seen some additional consequences of these abortion bans being allowed to go into effect in the form of higher rates of delayed care for pregnancy complications, which can lead to overall worse outcomes and maternal morbidity and mortality. In Texas, we're seeing that high-risk OB doctors are having to turn patients away, um, feeling like they are unable to counsel patients on the standard of care or even where or how to get the care they need if an abortion is indicated or having to wait until patients become very sick and become in imminent danger of dying before being able to perform an abortion when earlier care would have prevented medical decompensation. It is possible and highly likely that in California, those patients will start to come here for their delayed and high-risk care. And we do know that abortion restrictions in general don't reduce the need for abortion. Thus, many people have and will continue to self-manage their abortion. While self-management of an early abortion using pills sourced online is largely safe and indeed much safer than the pre road techniques of, of self-managed abortion, there are some legal consequences. Um, according to a, a national legal organization on reproductive health, there are seven states currently with laws explicitly criminalizing self-managed abortion, 10 states criminalizing um, a harm to fetus, and 15 states with criminal abortion laws that could be misapplied to people self-inducing abortion. And while we don't have such a law here in California, we also don't specifically have any laws explicitly protecting people who manage their own abortion. Next slide. So there are some additional sort of regulatory and insurance considerations and barriers as well, um, including the um, REMS restrictions on mifepristone. So um, the REMS restriction essentially places mifepristone as a, a sort of high risk medication that is really difficult to access. There were some recent changes in the REMS criteria for the mifepristone medication, um, which had um, lifted the in-person dispensing requirement for the medication. That being said, there remain many restrictions and stipulations on prescribing and dispensing the medication, including requiring providers to become registered prescribers, which presents an additional and somewhat intimidating hurdle, as this process is not required for the vast majority of much more dangerous medications that we prescribe on a regular basis. With the change in the dispensing requirements as well, um, there are some additional barriers that pharmacies must now overcome to begin, to begin dispensing the medication. Thus, most pharmacies will likely continue to not carry it and it will continue to be really difficult to access. Um, in terms of insurance coverage, so it, here in California, Medi-Cal does provide coverage for pregnancy-related care, including abortion care. And while this extends to folks who are undocumented, um, it is restricted to use by county of residence. So in California, 40% of counties do not have a known abortion clinic or abortion provider. So when patients have to cross county lines to obtain an abortion, they actually can't use their Medi-Cal and need to pay out of pocket. This limitation also prevents folks who are traveling for care from restricted states from accessing insurance coverage. In addition, for those who do have an abortion provider in their county and who can use their Medi-Cal, Medi-Cal has ultrasound bundled reimbursement, uh, which requires pre and post medication abortion ultrasounds, which is a minimum of two in-person visits. This limits the ability for telehealth and many primary care clinics who may not have access to ultrasound to be used to actually expand medication abortion access. These ultrasound bundled reimbursement rates incentivizes in-person care um, and reimbursement rates without ultrasound for Medi-Cal are often lower than operational costs, making it really difficult to sustain financially for small clinics and private practices. We also know that the Hyde Amendment, um, which it prohibits the use of federal dollars for abortion care leads to many barriers. In addition to preventing coverage of abortion care services for those crossing state lines, it also leads to just complicated billing processes, particularly for FQHCs um, who need to um, separate out uh, billing for abortions from the rest of the federally funded services that they may provide. This leads to siloed abortion care clinics, which, which further limits access, particularly in the rural areas that I've alluded to. Go ahead and next slide. And in addition to kind of just the cost of the medical, um, medical and procedural costs, there are many other costs that come along with abortions. As I mentioned, abortion providers can be few and far in between, particularly for more rural areas and in more restricted states. 
So while in California, 40% of counties have no abortion clinics, more than half of the states have greater than 90% of their counties without an abortion provider. And these are all the ones in dark blue here, which means that increased travel times and expenses, potential need for lodging, longer childcare needs, more time off work and lost wages for folks without enough or, or without usable paid sick time um, in, in places uh, where they don't have local abortion providers. And these barriers, of course, particularly impact folks with low income, um, communities of color, communities with limited English language proficiency, undocumented folks, and people with disabilities. For those who are already struggling to make ends meet, this becomes insurmountable for many. Um, and these costs will continue to astronomically rise, particularly for folks who have to travel far for, from restricted states for care. Next slide. Um, so in addition to all of these sort of structural um, barriers, there is also abound um, a lot of misinformation and stigma related to abortion care. Um, there was a recent Supreme Court case, NIFLA versus Becerra, um, that ruled against a California requirement for um, crisis pregnancy centers to post clear information about what care they do and don't provide, whether or not they have licensed medical staff, and where people can access state-sanctioned reliable information about pregnancy options, including abortion. What this means is that crisis pregnancy centers continue to be able to spread misinformation and deliberately de delay timely care. Um, and they are all over the country and including in California. Many healthcare systems that are religiously associated may also turn patients away, may not refer appropriately um, for services or care, and they may prevent trainees and staff from participating in abortion care, both within their settings and also outside of their healthcare settings within their contract stipulations. So because of the many reasons discussed that lead to abortion care being siloed, um, a lot of the standalone abortion clinics that um, do sort of overcome a lot of these hurdles and barriers become really stigmatized. They draw protesters who harass patients and clinicians alike. And this is compared to abortion care being incorporated into general, general primary care practice where the nature of services being sought is much more protected. Next slide. Um, so the last thing that I'll touch on, and I won't uh, go into a lot of detail because I'll, I'll next be passing this on to Leela to discuss in more detail, but it's just worth saying here that many family medicine programs don't offer abortion training at all. This may be limited by lack of support, by stigmatization, by liability or about practice issues, or by religious-based health systems. We also know that there is... Um, that experiences and outcomes of patients are improved when they receive culturally and linguistically concordant care from providers with similar backgrounds and experiences, and particularly for folks from historically marginalized and, and oppressed communities. There is currently a dearth of providers with a diversity of backgrounds and experiences providing abortion care. So matching the diversity of patients by emphasizing training of a diversity of providers is of utmost importance. Um, and here I will pass it on to Dr. Pollock to discuss a little bit more about training. Thank you. And I am going to just post a couple of links in the chat to um, a couple of organizations that are very involved in abortion training in family medicine. Um, so I realized that I didn't put their uh, logos on any of my slides, um, but I will be talking about them. And um, so, both folks from Ready, uh, which is the Center for Reproductive Health Education and Family Medicine, and from Teach, which is training in early abortion for comprehensive health care, um, were very instrumental in um, developing my slides and my comments today. So really thank them. Um, I, as both my and Christine have talked about and alluded to, um, abortion is health care. And the California Academy of Family Physicians recognizes this, as you can see from this slide. And one of the ways that we can limit the attacks on abortion care is through making it part of mainstream medicine. And in order to do that, we need family physicians who are trained in abortion care. Next slide. So despite our best efforts, we know that it's unlikely that every family medicine resident will go on to provide abortions. So why do I and many others think it's important that we train every resident in abortion care? Um, so 
when we provide opt-out abortion training in family medicine, we know that those graduates are more likely to go on to provide abortion. So about a quarter of graduates of opt-out training programs are providing abortions two to five years after graduation. And this compares to just 3% of family medicine graduates overall. Just gonna say that again. 3% of family medicine graduates are providing any sort of abortion care. Abortion training also builds other skills. So for people who don't go on to provide abortion care themselves, abortion training builds skills in options counseling, miscarriage management, and contra contraceptive services, including IUD and implant placements. And we also know that integrated training is even better. So when we have training that's provided in the family medicine setting, that leads to higher rates of abortion provision after residency. So not just residents going and training at high volume sites, but residents actually seeing abortion provided in their own family medicine clinics. Next slide. So who is getting training in abortion? Uh, so there are, uh, as far as I can tell, about 729 family medicine residencies in the United States. And just 42 of those, or 6%, have opt-out abortion training. And I've said this term uh, before, and I, I will define it. So opt-out abortion training basically means that as part of the curriculum in family medicine residency, there is training in abortion. So as part of a reproductive health block, um, for example, in the second year of residency, everyone is scheduled to spend time doing abortions. Um, and that usually happens in a combination of a high volume site um, like a Planned Parenthood or another high volume standalone abortion clinic um, and providing abortions in the family medicine clinic itself. Um, and this is abortion training, both in aspiration abortion or procedural abortion and in medication abortion. Um, there are, sorry, go back, uh, thank you. There are two more programs that have an established local elective. So um, residents can, uh, can rotate there without having to do too much legwork on their own. Everyone else, so all of these other 650 plus um, family medicine residencies, residents have to go out and find their own training, often on their own time, and many are actively discouraged or even told that they are not allowed to get abortion training as part of their residency program. Uh, next slide, thank you. Um, and so who is getting training? Um, my uh, spoke about the need to increase diversity among uh, abortion providers. And this starts with training a diverse set of trainees in abortion and really supporting Black, Indigenous, and people of color trainees. Um, we know from research that mentorship and role models are important enablers of abortion provision after residency. And I think it's important to think about who that um, who that enables to become abortion providers. I am a white woman. When I was training in residency, most of the people who trained me looked like me. Uh, most of the people who taught me looked like me. And, and it's important that we change that um, because it also means that in settings where getting trained is requires you to um, demonstrate your enthusiasm and your commitment and have someone who just agrees to train you, uh, we know that that means that mainly other white residents uh, and particularly white women are likely to get those opportunities. Um, and so that's something that is really important to change. Next slide. Um, so as uh, Christine talked about this, that people identify that abortion care is consistent with their values, but many aren't providing it. Um, so why? Um, we know that the intention to provide abortion care is predictive of, of providing it after residency. So people who say in residency, I want to provide abortions are more likely to be providing abortions after residency. But still, uh, a, the majority of people who intend to provide abortion do not go on to do so. So why is that? Um, so at least among graduates of opt-out programs, lack of training is very, very rarely the barrier. So barriers that have been identified are um, lack of mentorship and support of colleagues and staff, 
institutional restrictions, federal and state restrictions, for example, working in a federally qualified health center that requires a separate funding stream uh, to be able to provide abortion. Um, so that is has to do with the Hyde Amendment that Mai talked about. Um, the stigma of being an abortion provider, um, so fear of the, the backlash and, and harassment and violence in their community. Um, and again, that is worse if the only place where you can provide abortions is in a high volume clinic and not just as part of what you're doing every day in your family medicine clinic. Um, and something that we hear a lot in the Bay Area is uh, the area is saturated or there are no job openings. And that's something that I just would like to unpack a little bit. So this again is reliant on all abortion on this concept that all abortions are provided in standalone high volume clinics. And the only way I can provide abortions is if I'm able to get a job at one of those few clinics. And is that really the model that is serving patients? When we say, you know, there's enough access in my area, one, is that really true? Um, when abortion, when patients can't just come to you in your clinic the same way they would come to you and say, I need a birth control pill. Um, if they can't come to you and say, I need a, an abortion pill, then do they really have good access to abortion? Um, and two, what about in the rural areas that are not far from the Bay Area that don't have a high volume clinic? Um, do those people really have access to abortion? Um, next slide. And so, you know, I think, one big uh, barrier to providing is this continued siloing of abortion care as something that is separate from healthcare, something that's separate from mainstream medicine and something that's separate from routine family medicine care. And something that we all can be doing regardless of whether or not you provide abortions and regardless of whether or not you are even a physician is to normalize abortion in primary care, to talk about abortion, um, and to think about what it would mean for instead of abortion care to be this separate thing, for it to actually be an expectation and a norm for a family medicine clinic and for a family medicine provider. Um, I was on a call yesterday with a group of, of ready directors, so direct um, faculty from family medicine residencies who uh, lead abortion training in their residency. And someone on the call said that they're not doing medication abortion in their clinic because they have one vocal faculty member who's opposed to it and who threatens to quit if they provide family, if they provide medication abortion in their clinic. And what if they weren't allowed to have that single voice block access to this essential service? What if other faculty or staff threatened to quit if they didn't provide medication abortion? Or what if they had clinic or residency leadership who were willing to say, you know what, if you're blocking efforts to provide full spectrum care and family medicine, we don't need you. And I would challenge us all to say that, uh, that everyone, faculty, community providers, residents, staff alike, have an opportunity and an obligation to be at least raising the question of, do we provide abortion care in our clinic? Do we provide abortion training in our residency program? If not, why not? And how can we make that happen? And I will pass it back over to Dr. Fleming um, to talk some more about what we can do to make things better. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so as I mentioned, a lot of this was focused on, you know, what are the barriers, what are the issues that, that family docs are facing, that patients are facing um, in having this essential healthcare service. And so we, we just wanted to end with some opportunities to increase access to abortion for our patients that we take care of. Number one, first and foremost, go out there and provide abortions, right? This is absolutely within the realm of family medicine um, and something it's an essential healthcare service that we can all offer as part of our primary care practice. And really with, um, you know, not much additional um, need for training and, and especially with the medication abortion. Um, 
increase abortion training in family medicine. Um, and so uh, making sure that we have access for residents um, and trainees to have exposure and to have training in providing abortion care so that they can go out and provide abortions once they are done with their training. Um, there are a lot of opportunities for advocacy um, within the state and nationally, advocating for the removal, complete removal of the REMS restrictions for both providers and pharmacies um, for this very safe medication. Um, Medi-Cal reform um, and particularly um, expanding and broadening Medi-Cal accessibility beyond county lines, making it more um, either state or national um, based coverage Unbundling ultrasound for medic from Medi-Cal reimbursement and increasing reimbursement rates are all areas of advocacy, advocating to end the Hyde Amendment. Um, Nash on a national level, uh, the very first budget and I think maybe ever was just passed without the Hyde Amendment. Of course, it's not gonna actually be passed into law, but the fact that it was even passed through Congress for the first time is a huge step. Um, advocating for legal protections for both patients crossing state lines to access care and providers assisting in that care provision. And then uh, facilitating funding and logistical support for patients. We know that with these increasing um, barriers to care, increasing nationwide um, restrictions, many more people are gonna have to travel farther and farther away to obtain abortion care. Um, and we really need to help support folks in being able to get the care that they need. Um, and Oh, I think the last one, um, incorporating abortion care into standard primary care practice um, and um, making sure that we just communicate across the board in a variety of contexts, really wherever we go, that abortion care is healthcare. It really um, has no business being siloed out in the way that it has, and that only serves to further stigmatize this care. Thank you. I want to. I want to thank. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Fleming, Dr. Dellendorf, and Dr. Pollock for an incredible discussion, uh, or for an incredible set of slides that are leaving us uh, ready and poised for an incredible discussion, uh, with some great questions coming into the chat. And I would encourage you, if you haven't, uh, if you haven't asked questions or put your comments into the chat yet, um, then uh, this would be a great time to do so. Is it okay if we if we start the questioning? Is that all right from our presenters? Great, thanks. I, um, I'm going to take these um, slightly out of or I'm going to take these slightly out of order. I think um, uh, just to uh, just in the interest of um, keeping us on track. Um, the first question was uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Benzwi. Sorry if I mispronounced it. Um, uh, who asked? Um, could you please uh, restate whether there's any option for FQHCs to provide medication or other abortions? Um, and I'm actually gonna add another piece to that question, which is a lot of this talk was really provocative and focused a lot on trainees um, providing abortions. But I think the implicit question um, that I would add to Barbara's is, what does this mean if there's, an, if there's a, a shift in where people end up needing to go for abortions, what would this mean um, as the potential for family doctors who haven't been providing abortions to begin to provide them with medications or otherwise? Thanks. I can take a first stab at that, um, which is that medication abortion is incredible the medicine of it is incredibly simple. Um, and there are some, uh, some CMEs that you can do um, and we'd be happy to send out some resources afterwards or maybe as we're answering other questions can put some resources into the chat. Um, but there are, there are CMEs you can do that really go through the steps and the procedures for providing medication abortion have become simpler and simpler and require for many patients, I would say most patients, very few if any um, tests or evaluations other than a conversation. Um, and uh, federally qualified health centers, uh, because of the Hyde Amendment, 
because you, you can't provide federal funding to provide abortion, um, basically the funding stream needs to be, the funding needs to be separated. Um, so in California, the billing needs to go to Medi-Cal um, instead of funding through the, the um, I'm gonna say some of this wrong, but instead of funding through the bundled FQHC payment. Um, in other states, it requires, where, where Medicaid doesn't pay for abortion, um, it requires having, again, sort of a separate billing procedure. Um, and the uh, Reproductive Health Access Project has done a lot of work about helping providers provide medication abortion in family medicine clinics and in primary care clinics. And so um, I'll put a couple of other um, links in the chat as well, as well, but the Reproductive Health Access Project has a lot of great resources about um, how to step-by-step um, set up your federally qualified health center to provide abortion, um, particularly medication abortion, but also aspiration abortion. Um, and they and the folks at Ready um, will walk you through it step by step and help support you along the way. That's really yeah. helpful. Oh, go ahead. No, absolutely. Um, and then I know that this, um, this question was already answered, but sort of um, built in to that was the question around, um, you know, the process of, of um, have becoming a certified mifepristone prescriber. It's incredibly simple. There's literally one little form that you fill out with the manufacturer and that's it. Um, and so it, um, it feels like a big hurdle, but it's really not at all. I think that's great that you're talking about hurdles because there's other questions um, uh, from Dr. Meg Schwartzman and others in the chat or in the Q&A about, um, can you talk about other resources available for postgraduate training in both medical abortion and aspiration abortions um, so that folks who aren't in residency can add this to their skill set? You, you mentioned this um, somewhat already, but are there other, um, are there other national organizations that we should be looking to or other particular types of training? Thanks. So in terms of um, post-residency training, so I put in the chat the abortion pill CME, um, which is a free CME that is focused on um, training primary care docs on utilizing and implementing medication abortion into their practice. Um, again, this is very, um, it's exactly the same as, as managing miscarriage or early pregnancy loss with which many family docs have already incorporated into their practice. Um, so that's a really great resource. I'm also putting in now um, a site for the um, Clinical Abortion Training Centers, which is um, a, uh, a network of clinics across the country who have dedicated themselves to training folks outside of residency or post-residency um, in aspiration abortion and um, inviting folks to come um, and get training hands-on skills in those centers. Thanks, this is really helpful because I have to say as a career advisor, I get asked this question a lot actually too because people say, if I miss this training in residency, will I ever be able to go back and do it again or get more practice? So um, I'm glad that you guys have addressed this. There's, um, there's another great question here um, from Hannah, which asks, do you have ideas for FMRPs for family medicine residency programs um, based at FQHCs and how we can find abortion training experiences Rotation opportunities are very impact in the Bay Area, so residents are having to go far away to find training opportunities. Um, I, I don't have I don't have a like a specific one size fits all answer. Um, I would say if you're in the Bay Area, reach out to teach. Um, and it's true. I think so. So I have I have two answers to that. Sorry. One is uh, your FQHC can provide medication abortion and you can ask for that and you can advocate for that. And we and other people can help support you and uh, make that happen. Um, and then you get training in medication abortion in residency. Um, in terms of aspiration abortion, um, there are a number of uh, away electives that you can um, apply for and consider. Um, I don't know for sure, but have a feeling that if Roe gets overturned and there are states that automatically stop providing abortions, residents in those states are going to end up prioritized for those 
slots um, so that they can um, go back and provide abortions in, in border areas um, around the states that, that no longer have access to abortion. Um, but for right now, at least they're still open to residents all over the country. And that being said, um, the landscape might change a lot from what it is now, right? If we are looking into a world in which um, half of the states or more have completely banned abortion care, that means that the states that continue to provide access will have a significant increase in volume um, and significant increase in need for providers. Um, so things absolutely may change. I will, can I add just one other thing, which is, you know, I've talked a lot about how medication abortion is so simple and everyone can do it. And aspiration is also a pretty simple, basic procedure compared to the spectrum. I mean, I don't do colonoscopies, but I know that there are a lot of family docs who do flex cigs and colonoscopies. And I would wager that a manual uterine aspiration is way simpler than that. So uh, just to put it out there that it also, you know, I think this idea that you need to have done 500 abortion procedures before you can provide an abortion procedure, um, I think is also not accurate. Thanks, that's, a, that's, a, um, that's an important point, I think. And then I wanna make sure that we leave time for a question from Norman Archer, which is, what does abortion training look like for other primary care specialties such as peds and internal medicine? That's a great question. Um, I don't know kind of, uh, insight into this necessarily, although I know um, there are a few internal meds and peds providers that do provide abortion care. I think the pathway is a little bit more complicated, right? Whereas, you know, Leela had talked about um, the uh, how few family medicine um, residencies provide opt-out training or even provide a pathway for abortion training. I think even fewer internal medicine and pediatrics um, uh, programs also do. We're coming close to the end of the session. And I know from just the emails that I've gotten in advance, other contacts from trainees that we have a lot of trainees who are on the um, webinar today, including, including residents as well as students, um, not just from UCSF, but from elsewhere. And I guess my final question to you would be, if you had thoughtful words to, if, if you had thoughtful words to say to trainees about where this might fit into their career for today or for the future or other words of advice about how this should impact their decision-making um, around career choice and looking for a first job and just how they think of themselves as a family doctor. Um, can you leave us with some final thoughts and words? Thanks. And also thanks for a phenomenal presentation today. I'll jump in to start answering that great question. I think from our conversations with, again, early career family physicians in the study, we really heard loudly how much the values of this specialty resonate and how much this is something that people are carrying forward into their practice about caring for people in the context of their lives and their families and meeting the needs of patients and communities. And so I think just continuing to stay connected with those values around providing the broad spectrum of ambulatory care services, particularly those that are stigmatized. We talk a lot about PrEP care, about gender expansive care, and, and abortion and reproductive health care. All of those things are things that our patients, particularly in under-resourced communities, don't have access to. And by being part of the change where this, the, all those things are part of standard primary care, we can have a broad impact on the experience of our patients and our communities. And I think really this is about culture change. This is about abortion being healthcare and abortion being primary care. And at every step in the way, just reinforcing that with your colleagues, with your friends, and with your and with those senior to you, that's going to be what we how we see the change happen and how we really live up to our values as a specialty. I, I definitely agree with that. And um, I think asking about it in your residency interviews. Um, and I think, you know, 
right now we are kind of in a place where the people who go on to provide abortions make that a priority in their career choice and often build their careers around the opportunity to um to to provide abortions but i think that there are like places to be on the margins to interview for a job and say i want to provide medication abortions here? Is it possible that you could support me if I'm able to make that happen? And then not underselling your power as a junior clinician to continue to advocate and ask for that and make that happen and call on all of the resources that have been developed to help you make that happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the only other thing I think um, both Christine and Leela have very eloquently um, already covered this extensively, but I think um, the last thing that I'll sort of leave with is um, also don't underestimate your um, the power of your voice um, in sort of local, state, and national legislative advocacy, right? Um, legislators respect um, your experience, your expertise, um, regardless of where you are in, in the training journey, um, and really using that to advance policies that um, you feel will help you in your future careers and help your patients moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mai and Christine and Leela. I really appreciate um, the thoughtful perspective you shared today, and I especially appreciate all of our audience um, Who's, uh, who have been engaging in thinking this through with us. There's been some great questions and I know you have more. I would encourage everyone to get in touch with our presenters if they have additional questions and to continue the dialogue. Um, this is clearly an important issue that um, all of us are working together on. So thank you, have a great afternoon.